I'm Doris Wallace from the Diversity Outreach Committee, and I'm here to welcome you to our first in-person event, a speaker series that is being co-sponsored by Fridays at One and by Unmasking Bias series of the Diversity Committee. So welcome. Uh, LP Squared stands for Lifelong Peer Learning Program. That's a tough thing to say. And we have just celebrated our 60th year. Uh, we were first part of the IRP, and now we are happily ensconced in this CUNY um, as LP2. We are the oldest and longest running program for post-career peer learning in the country. And we are a model for other programs like this. We share the joy of learning and teaching with each other. LP2 is open to those who wanna to continue to learn among their peers in a vibrant and supportive environment. Our guest today is Jacqueline Woodson. Um, she is our first speaker in this new series. Uh, she has been praised both for her adult and her young adult novels. Jackie has received the National Book Award and the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, as well as many other awards. As part of her mission, Woodson founded the Baldwin Center for the Arts in Brewster, New York, to support the work of people of color. She hails from Brooklyn, yes, and is most welcome here at CUNY. Uh, we will have a question and answer period at the end of Jackie's talk. And so together, let us welcome Jackie Woodson. Thanks everyone. It's so nice to be here. And thanks to the folks that are watching. Um, I love CUNY. I actually have two close friends who work here and I love how close y'all are to me in Brooklyn. Um, I wanted to start, oh, I got to give a shout out to Abby, who's in the audience, and this is her first book, um, Patience is a Subtle Thief, so Harper, so <laughs> there she is. Uh, I just think it's so important that we recognize our folks who are just starting out, our folks who have been writing for a long time, and, and support their work. Um, so I wanted to start, actually by reading a P, uh, the first poem in my memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming. And um, I wanted to read this because I wanted to give context to my work and to what I'm gonna talk about in Red at the Bone and Another Brooklyn. So how many of you have not read my work and you won't get in trouble if you've never read anything I've written? Okay, that's that's really good to know because I always hate when you go to a reading and someone starts talking about their work like you've been reading it for decades and you don't know what they're talking about. Um, I remember I was at this um, reading in Provincetown and the guy who was a poet said, well, I'm just gonna read um, poems that you asked me to read. And I'm like, well, I don't know your work. So, you know, we sat there silently for a long time. And then finally someone knew a poem he had written so this is from Brown Girl Dreaming, February 12th, 1963. I am born on a Tuesday at University Hospital, Columbus, Ohio, USA, a country caught between black and white. I am born not long from the time or far from the place where my great great grandparents worked the deep rich land, unfree, dawn till dusk, unpaid, drank cool water from scooped out gourds, looked up and followed the sky's mirrored constellation to freedom. I am born as the South explodes, too many people, too many years, enslaved, then emancipated, but not free. The people who look like me keep fighting and marching and getting killed so that today, February 12th, 1963, and every day from this moment on, brown children like me can grow up free, 
can grow up learning and voting and walking and writing wherever we want. I am born in Ohio, but the stories of South Carolina already run like rivers through my veins. So Brown Girl Dreaming is a memoir. It was my 33rd book. I think I've written, no, maybe 32nd. I've written about 36 books now. Um, and I've written everything from picture books to middle grade to young adult. Uh, to adult. Um, I've written for newspapers. I've written for magazines. I've written screenplays. I just finished the screenplay um, based on the life of Ida B. Wells, who's on my shirt. And Ida B. Wells was the journalist who basically invented, invented investigative journalism um, and really investigated the lynchings that were happening post reconstruction, but that's a whole other story. And I've known I wanted to be a writer since I was seven years old. And um, I am, I, I consider myself Brooklyn to the bone, but I'm a Buckeye. I was born in Ohio. And then when I was around a couple of months old, my uh, mother and father separated and my mother moved us back to South Carolina where her parent, her mother and father lived. And so I actually spent a lot of my childhood in Greenville, South Carolina, which was a very segregated South at the time. And this was in the 60s and the 70s. Um, and I grew up in a uh, small town, a small area in Greenville called Nickel Town. And, um, and in that part of South Carolina, growing up with my grandmother and my mother, grandmother, mother, and grandfather, um, I figured out story because we were, there were always being stories told. I also grew up Jehovah's Witness and Muslim. And all of this you find out in Brown Girl Dreaming. So when I sat down to write Brown Girl Dreaming, I was trying to figure out how I got to this point of being a writer. Um, coming from a family that didn't have much money, coming from, um, Ohio, South Carolina, and eventually Bushwick, the Bushwick section of Brooklyn, which is the old Bushwick, not the Bushwick a lot of people know now. Um, and, and coming from a place where I read very, very, very slowly. I have a TED talk called, um, I have a TED talk all about reading slowly. And um, as a kid, I got in trouble for reading slowly because teachers wanted you to read faster. They wanted you to excel in reading. They wanted you to be a heavy, uh, you know, at a higher reading level than your grade level. And, and there was a celebration of that. And I was always reading the same things over and over. And I was always um, still reading something long after the class had moved on to the next thing. And I realized as an adult, and I, again, I talk about this in the TED talk, um, that in order to be a writer, you have to read slowly. You have to read as an engaged reader. You have to read to understand how authors tell stories because the books become your mentor text. These become the ways that you learn how to write. And so while all these kids were being rushed through reading, I realized that no, I, I really engage with literature. I love the written word and I wanna understand if somebody makes me cry, in their story, how they did that. So let me go back and read it. And as a result, I ended up memorizing a whole lot of books. This is um, The Woodsons of, of Ohio. And so Brown Girl Dreaming is a memoir and it's written in verse. So it's written in small moments like poems. It's written that way because that's how memory comes to us, right? It comes to us in these small moments with all of this white space, all of this stuff that's unknown around it. When you think of your life story, you don't think of it as chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. You think of it, I remember this happening and then I remember that happening and then this happened, but did this happen at the same time that that happened? So when I was writing it, I just wrote down everything I could absolutely remember. Um, and I knew that when I stopped, when my, I didn't have any more memories, I planned to ask my mother. Um, I planned to ask my siblings. And um, halfway through the writing of Brown Girl Dreaming, my mom died suddenly at 68. And so that door suddenly closed. I didn't have those stories anymore. And I realized the importance of 
asking the people in our lives to tell them our stories because once they're gone, those stories are gone with them. Um, and my mother having come from the South, from a Jim Crow South, a very segregated and South that was painful to remember, wasn't a storyteller, didn't talk about her past a lot. And I don't know, um, Phyllis and I were talking about Isabel Wilkerson, who wrote a book called The Warmth of Other Sons, which is such a beautiful book. And I, if it is possible, it's even more beautiful as an audio book. Um, I did both. I read it and I listened to it and listening to it felt like watching a movie. Um, but what Isabel talks about in this book that's about the Great Migration, which is the same path my family got from South Carolina to New York City is the trauma, right? That um, people who migrated are the same as immigrants in that they left a painful past for someplace that felt safer. And so, and a lot of times with that migration comes PTSD, right? You don't want to talk about that painful past you came from, be it, you know, Germany or South Carolina or Rwanda, like whatever it is, there that, that door in your memory you want to close and not harken back those memories. And for my mother and grandmother, once they got to New York City, they were like, we're not talking about what happened in the South. So a lot of those stories I didn't get. And when I was ready to ask them, my grandmother, uh, you know, try to peel them out of them. My grandmother had moved on. My mother had moved on. But also as a kid, having said I was going to be a storyteller, when I came downstairs and my mom and grandma were talking, they shut up. They were like, we don't want you spreading our laundry, dirty laundry out and telling your little friends what's going on in our family. Uh, we don't want you telling our, our stories. And I always wanted to say, you know, the characters in my head are so much more interesting than y'all. But, but my family was for the South and I would have gotten my behind beat. So, but, um, but once my mom passed away, I decided that I was going to go back down South and interview all my cousins, interview um the people she grew up with and get their stories about my mom as a young person. So this book that started out as this book that was supposedly just about me became this much more extensive story. I also am lucky enough to have an aunt who's a genealogist. And so, and my aunt had, and this is my aunt on my dad's side, had records of the family going all the way back. Um, and so I relied on her, my aunt Ada a lot. So I went to Ohio, I interviewed my dad, I interviewed my aunt, I just talked to tons and tons of people um, and, and started writing the story. This is called The Woodsons of Ohio. My father's family can trace their history back to Thomas Woodson of Chillicothe, said to be the first son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Some say this isn't so but the Woodsons of Ohio know what the Woodsons coming before them left, and left behind and Bibles and stories and history coming down through time. So ask any Woodson why you can't go down the Woodson line without finding doctors and lawyers and teachers, athletes and scholars and people in government. They'll say, we had a head start. They'll say Thomas Woodson expected the best of us. They'll lean back, lace their fingers across their chest, smile a smile that's older than time, say, well, it all started back before Thomas Jefferson Woodson of Chillicothe. And they'll begin to tell our long, long, long story. Um, so, as I was writing Brown Girl Dreaming, and I promise this is getting too red at the bone, because one thing about writing is it's a, um, there's a map to it. When you look at an author's writing, you'll see what the book that came before influences the next book, influences the next book, influences the next book. So I wrote Brown Girl Dreaming, and then I wrote another Brooklyn, and then I wrote Red at the Bone, and I had some picture books and some other middle grade books in between there, and you'll see themes running through them, but I wouldn't have been able to write Red at the Bone without having written Brown Girl Dreaming. And this is the last thing I'm reading from Brown Girl Dreaming, and it's called It'll Be Scary Sometimes. So when I was in, I was in DC and I was at a bookstore called Politics and Prose, and I was doing a reading and NPR was there and they were going to interview, they were into, it was um, 
Kat Chow from Code Switch. And she was interviewing, she was coming to interview me about my great, great grandfather and my great, great grandfather who had been in the civil war. And I have this poem there. So let me read it to you first. My great, great grandfather on my father's side was born free in Ohio. 1832, built his house and farmed his land, then dug for coal when the farming wasn't enough, fought hard in the war, his name in stone now on the Civil War Memorial. William J. Woodson, United States Colored Troops, Union Company B, 5th Regiment. A long time dead but living still among the other soldiers on that monument in Washington, D.C. His son was sent to Nelsonville, lived with an aunt, William Woodson, the only brown boy in an all white school. You'll face this in your life someday. My mother will tell us over and over again, a moment when you walk into a room and no one there is like you. It'll be scary sometimes, but think of William Woodson and you'll be all right. So, Brown Girl Dreaming had been out for a while. It had won the National Book Award. It had gotten um, translated into all these languages. And now we're at um, Politics and Prose Bookstore and Kat Chow is there and she's about to go into, she's about to interview me. And she wants to do the interview at the Civil War Memorial where supposedly my great, great grandfather's name is on that stone. <laughs> and so, the information that I have about my great, great grandfather, I got from my aunt, the genealogist. I wasn't trying to fact check. So, you know, she had it written down, you know, and she said it was true. And so Cat Chow shows up and we're going over there and I'm like, oh God, please let this be true. Please let this be true. And so I walk over to the Civil War Memorial memorial and as I get there Kat's already there and she's jumping up and down she's like I found it I found your great-grandfather's name and she shows me his name on the stone and I just bursted out crying because history is so intangible at times right you have these stories and you have to believe the stories and and especially when you think of people of color who weren't allowed to read and write, who weren't allowed to have access to a certain way of keeping history and narrative. Um, so what we had was oral history. Um, and, and so there's always that question, did this happen, did this not happen? And when I got to that stone and I saw William J. Woodson there and I knew that I had been here so long and that, you know, to have people who have fought in the Civil War and then to go back and, and further than that and further than that, it just kind of broke my heart and put it back together again. And I had never been that emotional about something, but I'm like, of course it's true. Of course these stories don't come out of nowhere. And I wrote a book many, many years ago called Showway about um, the history of my family on my maternal side going all the way back to my great, great, great grandmother. I think it goes back seven generations. Um, and the theme of it um, are the quilts that were used during the Underground Railroad as um, maps to war to, for enslaved people to make their way to freedom. And I remember I was in Kentucky and this white woman said to me, well, people say that this is not true because why did no one know about it? And I'm like, Black folks knew about it. And then she's like, well, they didn't write about it. And I'm like, they weren't allowed to write. Well, how come the people who did write didn't know about it? Because who was telling the people who knew how to write, right? Like who was going to go up to Master's house and say, yo, they got some quilts going on back there and they're like getting out of here. So it was so interesting to hear a denier in that way say your history is not true and knowing that our history is true and you know since then of course a lot more information has come out about the history of quilting but it was really interesting because I, I was not prepared I was like wait are you saying my history is a lie and I was young I mean I, I just I was not prepared but I'm prepared now I've grown um so brown girl dreaming was an interesting journey for a writer because here was a book that I thought I was writing as a middle grade book. But then I started getting 
fan mail for it. And, and, you know, it's called Brown Girl Dreaming. So the first fan mail I got was from a whole lot of brown girls. I love your book. I see myself in it. Then I started getting all this mail from 11 year old white boys. They're like, I'm an 11 year old white boy. Cause that's how, that's how I knew they were. Um, and my teacher made me read this book in school and I really loved it because, and it kind of blew my mind, but of course they started seeing parts of themselves. Then I started getting mail from white men in their 70s. And they, I probably got about 40 letters. And these men were coming from all over the country. And my grandfather, Hope Woodson, had been their baseball coach in Nelsonville, Ohio. So for something like 30 years, my grandfather co coached baseball. And we were one of the few black families in Nelsonville, Ohio. And these kids who are now old men had remembered him. And so I just think the power of story and the power of, of the community's work is so long reaching and long lasting um, that it just blew my mind. So I wrote Brown Girl Dreaming and then I wrote another Brooklyn. Brown Girl Dreaming was a memoir written in verse. I said, I did that. So what can I do next? Because one thing about being a writer is you don't want to do the same thing over and over again. I always think of that Joni Mitchell song, um, Circle Game. She's talking about it on her album. And she says, people are always asking her to sing Circle Game, but no one ever asked Van Gogh to paint a starry night again. And so like, why should musicians and, and writers have to do the same thing again and again? And I didn't want to paint a starry night again. Um, so the next book I wrote, I decided my mom had died and um, I inherited the house I had grown up in, in Bushwick. And I went back to the house um, and I was going to sell it. And I started looking around the neighborhood and seeing how quickly it was changing. So when I was growing up there, we moved to Bushwick from Brownsville and from, um, we moved to Greenville, South, from Greenville to Brownsville to Bushwick. My mother was a single mom, and I don't know, I'm sure some of you know, during that time, if you weren't married, you had you couldn't get a credit card, you couldn't get a bank account. Like there were all these kind of boundaries. And she finally got a job at Con Edison and she worked there for many, many years. We were renting an apartment in this house. Um, and then eventually, and I couldn't stand the landlord. The landlord was a guy named Michael Enzarello who lived in Brentwood, Ohio, Brentwood, Long Island. And he would come and he would bang on our door and he'd ask for the rent. And I just thought, I hate this guy. He's so cruel. Why is he, you know, my mom would sometimes hide because she didn't have the rent. Um, my mother eventually ended up buying the house from Mr. Enzarello. And when she died, and this was in the 70s, um, but when she died, I found, you know, I had all her papers and I found the deed and it turned out that he had sold her this house and let her pay for it over a period of 20 years. So he had actually sold it to her very cheaply. And then knowing my mom didn't have the money to pay for it all at once, just let her use her rent to pay for it. So this guy who I had always thought was this villain turned out to not be that at all. Um, and it was just, of course, by then, by the time I tried to find him, he had long passed away to, you know, just thank him for this grace that I had no idea about, but, um, you know, grace hides in all kinds of places. And it's just a question of always remembering that it's there and being open to finding it. So when we moved to Bushwick, um, the block was there were a couple of white families on the block. It was predominantly black and Latino. A lot of black folks were coming in um, via the great migration. A lot of um, people were coming in from Ecuador and Puerto Rico, um, Santo Domingo. Um, and, and by the end of, um, I would say the mid seventies, it was all black and Latino. All, the, the white flight had happened and white people had bounced. When my mom died, I noticed white people were coming back to Bushwick. And they I remember listening to an um, um, 
an NPR show where someone was talking about discovering Bushwick. And I always say Columbusing because no one's discovering anything, right? Like, you know, unless you're part of the Lenape people, you have not founded this land. So, so um, I, I started, I decided not to sell the house and I decided I wanted to write about the history of Bushwick and and um, and I wanted to write a book that was nonfiction. So that would be the history of Bushwick. And that was fiction, which is the story of these four girls. And that was poetry, which is all about the line breaks, the spacing, the white space and how and really forcing the reader to read the book slowly and um, with a certain kind of breathing almost. And so I started writing Another Brooklyn. And Another Brooklyn, of course, pays homage to another country, um, James Baldwin, and to Colm Tobin's Brooklyn, um, because that's what it, this is what it is. And I open it with, um, for Bushwick, 1970 to 1990 in memory, which is going back to writer's intention. So I'm just going to read a short passage from this from another Brooklyn and then a bit from Red at the Bone and then you could ask me questions. For a long time, my mother wasn't dead yet. Mine could have been a more tragic story. My father could have given in to the bottle or the needle or a woman and left my brother and me to care for ourselves or worse in the care of New York City Children's Services where my father said there was seldom a happy ending. But this didn't happen. I know now that what is tragic isn't the moment, it is the memory. If we had had jazz, would we have survived differently? If we had known our story was a blues with a refrain running through it, would we have lifted our heads, said to each other, this is memory, again and again until the living made sense? Where would we be now if we had known there was a melody to our madness? Because even though Sylvia, Angela, Gigi, and I came together like a jazz improv, half notes tentatively moving toward one another until the ensemble found its footing and the music felt like it had always been playing. We didn't have jazz to know this was who we were. We had the top 40 music of the 1970s trying to tell our story. It never quite figured us out. So I'm just skipping. The summer I turned 15, my father sent me to a woman he had found through his nation of Islam brothers, an educated sister, he said, who I could talk to. By then I was barely speaking. Where words had once flowed easily, I was suddenly silent, breath snatched from me, replaced by melancholy my family couldn't understand. Sister Sonia was a thin woman, her brown face all angles beneath the black hijab. So this is who the therapist became to me, the woman with the hijab, fingers tapered, dark eyes questioning. By then, maybe it was too late. Who hasn't walked through a life of small tragedies? Sister Sonia often asked me, as though to understand the depth and breadth of human suffering would be enough to pull me outside my own. So the person telling the story in that book is, is named August and she's an anthropologist. And I don't know how many writers in, in the room, but you really do figure your writing out as you're writing it. I never outline, I never know where a book is going. I never know how it's gonna end. I never know what it's trying to say. Um, I never know what it's about. I just write and let the characters tell me. And there's a saying that sometimes the story knows more than you do about what it's trying to say. And I trust that process. So I am going to end by reading a short section from Red at the Bone because now y'all know how I got here. And um, Red at the Bone, I'm not gonna tell you what it's about because I still don't know. But um, one thing that it's inspired by and uh, is, um, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. And it's sandwiched between two tragedies. And what I wanted to investigate in this book is black economic wealth, what happens to it and why. Um, and also the other many wealths that black and brown communities have when we don't have economic wealth. 
Um, <clears throat> but you could ask me more about this. One, I'm just gonna read the beginning and this book starts in the middle and everybody who knows anything about um, life knows that we're always coming in in the middle of it. So you're not, this book doesn't open at the beginning of the story, right? It's, it's, we're part of a long, long, long narrative. And I was very intentional about opening it with this sentence. But that afternoon there was an orchestra playing. Music filling the brownstone, black fingers pulling violin bows and strumming cellos, dark lips around horns, a small brown girl with pale pink nails on flute. Malcolm's younger brother, his dark skin glistening, blowing somberly into a harmonica, a broad shouldered woman on harp. From my place on the stairs, I could see through the windows, curious white people stopping in front of the building to listen. As I descended, the music grew softer, the lyrics inside my head becoming a whisper. I knew a girl named Nikki, I guess you could say she was a sex fiend. No vocalist. The little girl didn't know the words. The broad shouldered woman having once belted them out loud while showering was now saved and refused to remember them. Iris wouldn't allow them to be sung and Malcolm's brother's sweet seven-year-old mouth was full. Still, they moved through my head as though Prince himself was beside me. I'm gonna stop there at the cotillion for Melody. Thank you. So now we get to ask questions. Y'all get to ask me questions and really nothing you can ask me is wrong. I'm happy to answer anything about anything. Um, and I feel like I've written about everything. So go for it. Yes, thank you. Um, have you been inspired by any writers that you could mention? Um, have I been inspired by any writers? I've been inspired by every writer. I, I feel like, um, uh, again, I said, like I said earlier, you learn to write by reading. So, of course, I mentioned Baldwin and Tobin. Um, of course, you know, the canon of Black women writers, including Morrison and Shange and um, <clears throat> Walker and um, lots of poets. I really love poetry a lot. So everybody from Mark Doty to Tim Siebels to um, Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, so yeah, I mean, Carson McCullers, Raymond Carver for his minimalism, um, even though he was anti-Semitic and so deeply problematic, I really like Hemingway, um, the, the writing, not the person and some of the writing, no way. Uh, Steinway, of course, um, I just came back from getting the Steinway um, award and 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 when they told me I had won it, I went back and did a deep dive into his work and saw what a humanitarian he was. Well, you know, really how he was thinking about how he was thinking progressively and in terms of social justice, what he was trying to say. So yeah, lots of writers. I I could have this conversation all day. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Okay. Um... I mean, you've you've written for so many different age groups, and I know young adults, uh, you know, my stepkids and kids have loved it and learned so much. I'm interested in what is it really from your experiences or from reading that allows you to understand young people mm -hmm. so much and to understand, and not only just to, uh, that you understand young people so much, is you you're able to write for so many different age groups. <laughs> that seems to me a real, real beautiful gift Thank that you, you have, but I'm wondering where it comes from. Uh, that's such a great question too. Um, Madeline Lingle, who wrote among other books, um, Wrinkle in Time said that when you write, you should write remembering the child you were because the essence of childhood doesn't change, right? The fashion, the technology, all of that stuff changes. You don't have to talk about that, but the essence of childhood doesn't change. We wanna belong. We want our family to not be freaks. We want, you know, we, we are thinking about the world and not quite understanding it. And we don't have that language yet, but something in our head is beginning to have that language. Like all of that is, is in all of us, right? And um, and I think the the, the thing that is hardest is going back to that place and remembering it. And I think I never left it. You know, I, I have such a deep love and respect for young people. I, and 
and this is across the board. I had it 30 years ago for the young people that were young then. I have it now for the young people that are young now. Um, I just think that they, they really have this grace and this awareness and this thoughtfulness that in so many of us somehow gets beaten out of us and this wonder. Um, so so when, I, when I write for them, I do go back to remembering who I was as a child and what I wanted. Um, and that, that becomes the universal. And so when you look at something like Brown Girl Dreaming, which is so deeply specific, I mean, you know, Ohio, Nelsonville, Ohio, Bushwick, like Greenville, South Carolina, wanting to be a write, writer, a composition notebook, Jehovah's Witness, like they're all these very specific things. But in that specificity is a, is a universality that people, young people really understand and get. Uh, Cause here I am, I'm almost 60 years old and, and 11 year old kids and 12 year old and 15 year old kids get what I'm saying. We're having this conversation still. And that's because again, when I, I'm writing for them I go back to that place. When I'm writing adult fiction, I'm still, a lot of my characters are young adults. Um, like you meet August, who's 50, she goes from being 15 to about 31. Um, in Red at the Bone, it's told from a lot of point of views, including Melody, who's 15, and Sabi, who's in her 60s. But um, um, but even when I'm writing for when I'm writing from a, a young person's point of view, as an in adult books is as an adult looking back on that. When I'm writing as a young person in middle grade and young adult. I'm right at I'm writing in that moment in time. So that that's where it makes it hard to write for two at once because I'm like, am I a young person here or I'm an old person looking back on being a young person because the language is different, right? And the wonder is different. But I like the challenge of it too. Ah, all of my books are for you. Yeah. I I know. You know, it's yeah. I, I know, I know it is. I, I it's so funny because um I think when I look at like I just wrote a picture book called The World Belonged to Us and and it's all about the games we played when we were kids like Scully and stickball and hopscotch and double dutch and handball and um and 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 it's this ode to play because kids don't play the way we played and and one thing I was thinking about when I was writing it I live in Park Slope now and I remember these kids were playing on the sidewalk and they were playing jump rope and this um, guy was walking past from work. He's tied. And he was so mad because they didn't stop quick enough. They're, they didn't stop their play. And I just remember as a kid, grownups walked in the street because we weren't allowed to go into the street. So they saw us playing. They went around us and you know, kept on walking. And I just thought this is, this is A, the street play is gone and B, the respect we had for childhood play is gone and children. And so, so I don't know that I feel like that's me being almost 60 looking back <laughs> on, on childhood, but it, it's interesting in terms of thinking of me writing from my age now, I maybe when I'm 80, I'll go back and look back at my younger days of being almost 60 say you will be <laughs> thank you oh um oh hi yes hi. um so i i am leading a study group on the year 1971 we're looking back at 1971 and we happened to talk about the conversation that nikki giovanni and um, james baldwin had I, I don't know if you've I've seen that before, heard of it. Um, but I know that, well, I think that those two are people that influenced you. Mm -hmm. And I know you talked about, you know, a whole range of writers who um, who influenced you, but can you speak specifically about those two? Uh huh. So yeah, that's, it's, it's so worth um, watching, listening to, if you all haven't listened to the, listen to the Baldwin Giovanni conversation. Also, I think Hansberry and Baldwin talking is very interesting, but that was such a seventies conversation. Um, the, I, the thing that um, Nikki Giovanni just retired from UVA last week. So, um, but the the re the way Nikki Giovanni inspired me. I remember my mother had an album, a record album, 
and it had Nikki on the cover and she has this huge Afro and this, you know, bright smile. And, and my mother was playing it. And I think on it, Giovanni was doing then a soft black song. I can't remember, but she was, there was music behind her and she was talking and, and, you know, she was reciting poetry. And I remember being in my mom's living room and I was a little kid and I, st I was like, what is that? <laughs> like, and it blew my mind. Like, I was like, she's telling a story. Those are words. She's not singing, but there's music. Like my mind was blown. My mind was absolutely blown. And after that, I got everything Nikki Giovanni had written. You know, I went to the library and it's like Nikki Giovanni, Nikki Giovanni. Um, it was, it was my first spoken word, really. I mean, she was the goat of, of like putting music and words together that way. And, and then I remember as a young writer coming across, um, Knoxville, her picture book called Knoxville. And it's a picture book. I, I forget who did the illustrations, but it's based on her poem. I, you know, I like summer best. We eat corn and, you know, it, it's just this beautiful, um, poem that's just talking about going back down south and 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 having a life as a child and and so again I was like wait you can do that you can just tell an ordinary story and it becomes something that people want to read and again it was very specific and and so she was you know one of my teachers from afar in that way by that time I hadn't met her yet I've since met her um James Baldwin, the same thing. It was um, If Beale Street Could Talk, which was the first book I read of his. I remember reading Beale Street Could Talk and um, and The Bluest Eye in fifth grade. I got both these books out of the library and, and The Bluest Eye. Um, it's so interesting because for years I swore my memory of the bluest eye was that Pacola Breedlove, the main character in that book, got blue eyes and lived happily ever after. <laughs> and I read that book as a, again as an adult and I swore, and this is an adult, I'm an adult now, I'm swearing to people that Toni Morrison wrote two versions of this book, that she wrote a kid's version with a happily ever, I swear, and I'm like in my 30s at this point. And then she wrote this adult version that where she ends up, you know, going, losing her mind. Um, and it took me a couple of years to realize there was only one version, but I had been a kid and I completely compartmentalized. Um, and the same thing with If Beale Street Could Talk. I remember um, Tish and Fani, um, they were teenage lovers and they had a baby and they lived happily ever after. Like, And then again, I, re I read it again as an adult and I was like, nope, that's not how I thought he had. Well, I won't tell the ending if you haven't read If Beale Street Could Talk, but but again, what I learned from Baldwin um, is that as long as there's hope in the book, there doesn't have to be a happy ending. Um, but but that hope has to be there somewhere. And, and the ending has to resonate in some way that makes the reader feel hopeful. Um, but, but yeah, so they were, they remain great teachers of mine. Thank you. I would love to take that class. Hi. Um, hi. Oh, hey, should I Abby. Let that person go first. Yeah, right. Oh, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to know what's your what was your first book and what was the experience like for you being a first time mm -hmm. author? And also, um, earlier we talked about when you think you know what you're writing, um, and it all falls apart. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that space? Uh, so my first book was a book called Last Summer with Mason, which was a middle grade book. And um, my early books, the thing I loved about them was Leo and Diane Dillon did the covers of all of them. Um, and they were an interracial husband and wife team. And if you look them up and look at their illustration, you go, oh, I know that. Um, I know them. Um, I thought that first book that I was going to blow up and everyone was going to know my name. And then I think like, six people read it um and 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 I had already finished the dear one I had already I was deep into my second book by that time and I was also writing publishing poetry and short stories so for my me my first book I made sure I kept on going 
I made sure that, you know, I, I was working on something else. Um, I, I learned, um, and, and it got a good review in the times. I remember, um, Karen Brailsford, who was, uh, um, um, at the times gave it a really nice review, which at that time, the times wasn't reviewing a lot of books. Um, but Karen, is, it turns out her daughter's Amanda Sternberg, who, you know, of course, wasn't born yet, but it's just such a small black world when I think about it. And, um, and, but still, at that time, the Times book review was for your friends to see your book review. They weren't going to buy it. I mean, I think that happens a lot. Like people get their books reviewed in Times and it's not like their friends run out and buy it or people run out and buy it. They read the review and they're like, yeah, I read that review. It was good. So I'm going to read the next one, but they don't necessarily buy your book. But in, a, in my first book was published before social media. Um, so so um, I, it just it had an okay life. It's still in print. <laughs> like, um, and, it, and I think it wasn't until... And I was still working full time. Um, it wasn't until um, about my fourth book that I got my first residency at McDowell and McDowell changed my life. And then from McDowell, I went to the Fine Arts Work Center, um, which is in Provincetown. And it's a seven month residency where they give you a stipend and a place to live. And basically they're trying to take the stress off of your, your work, you know, your life so that you can be an artist and I ended up living in Provincetown for five years and that's when I wrote a bulk of my work and then when I came back I was writing full-time uh, you know I had written by then I was like 12 books in and I was finally writing full-time and people were beginning to know who I was and and it was incremental right because um the young adult and children's book world knew who I was I had written one adult book called autobiography of a family photo that you know had a tiny life, a little traction. Um, but but then um, some more people knew and then some more people knew. And then it wasn't until I won the National Book Award that I got a much more national audience. It wasn't until, you know, I got the Asher Lindgren Memorial Award that I got a much more international audience. So, so it was incremental. Um, and there's still people here who have never read me. So um, I think that I think that it's so important for writers to just keep writing in terms of the book falling apart. It happens every time. So every time you write a book, the stages, you write the book it's brilliant. You know, you're the most brilliant writer that ever lived. Everyone's going to love this book. It's going to win all the awards. Um, and then you wake up and you read it, the, what you, the pages you've written one day and you're like, this sucks. Like, why, do, why am I even writing? Why am I even alive? Like, um, and then that's, that's where the book falls apart. And that's where the exciting work begins. That's where the scaffolding begins. That's when you really have to start asking yourself, what is this book trying to say? And how is it trying to say it? Um, what does the character want? And how is the character going to get it? And those questions allow you to begin to scaffold and build and tell your story. But, you know, I've written almost 40 books. Every single book falls apart. I'm, I, have, I, I have a book in my bag that, you know, is just on the other side of the fall apart. I think it is my editor and I might not, but, but, um, but yeah, it's that at that point where it's like, ah, I got to figure this out. I remember I wrote a book called after Tupac and D Foster, and this was an interesting story. Well, to me, I hope hoping it is to y'all too, <laughs> but I wrote it and, you know, Tupac love Tupac, um, three girls who are Tupac fans. And there's a person telling the story. I cannot for the life of me, figure out the narrative narrator's name. Um, and I'm inserting all these names and they don't work. That's not who she is. Um, and it wasn't until about the fifth draft of this book that I realized why I couldn't figure out her name. Because and in understanding that, I understood what the book was trying to say. I knew it was talking about identity. I knew it was talking about thinking you know someone intimately and not really knowing them at all um, and all of these things. But I had to get to that point of it falling apart. And and realizing that again, it knew more than I did. Like if I threw Deborah in there, it was wrong. Like the book kept telling me, you're wrong, you're wrong. Like, listen to this. Like you're trying to write about something and you don't even know that yet. So so as cliched as it sounds, trust the process um, and give yourself, give yourself um, the grace to let it fall apart and not be afraid of that because it, it just gets better. Thank you, Abby. Hi, 
Hello. I just want to thank you. You're absolutely brilliant as far as I'm concerned. Oh, thank you. It was so many, many books that you've written. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your day-to-day pro -day process? I mean, you're going, you're coming here. So that cut into your writing day. So could you explain that? <laughs> Oh man, yes, that's a, such a great question. What the process changed? I mean, COVID broke a lot of us, right? In so many ways. I think one of the ways it broke me was that I was um, with my family, um, and and the work. It was hard to turn off the work, right? It was like I should be working. I should be working. I should be working. Um, and looking back on that now, I wish I had a, been able to turn that off. And coming out of it is like, I should be writing, I should be writing. Um, so my writing process before COVID um, was my family went off, you know, my beloved went to work, the ch my children went to school, my daughter's in college now, but, but the kids went off um, and I had from 7.30 till around 2.30 to just be Jacqueline Woodson, the writer. Around 2.30, I had to come back into motherhood and I have an office in my house downstairs um, and I would just go down there and begin the process. And sometimes it meant just doing some research or, or rewriting or everything I write, I read out loud because it has to sound a certain way as well as look a certain way on the page. Um, when, after COVID, I had to kind of, because writing is a muscle, and if you don't use it, it atrophies, and so mine had atrophy because I was also writing screenplays, which is what I did. I said, I'm going to write something completely different because this is a completely different time and calls, calls for a different kind of energy, um, so I write, wrote the screenplay for Red at the Bone. I wrote a, a series for Behind You. I wrote the Ida B. Wells screenplay. Um, and now my writing process, and always throughout my life, there has been a lot of procrastination, right? So I sew, um, I clean my house all the time. You know, I, I have two huge dogs. I take them to the park. I find all kinds of ways not to write and then feel guilty about not writing. But um, now, like today, because I'm speaking now about writing and then I'm, I'm in residence at the Kennedy Center. So I'm heading to the Kennedy Center from here because I'm um, putting, I, I, I just wrote a play with Toshi Regan, my best friend, and, um, and we're in rehearsals for it. And so on the train for the four hours that I'm on the train, I'm going to work on my manuscript. And then when I get to the Kennedy Center is homecoming week at Howard, where my daughter is. So I'm going to a step show and then Tana has a friend of mine is having a party tomorrow. So I'm doing lots of homecoming stuff, but I'm also going to write. And because I can sleep late on nights when I can sleep on days when I could sleep late, I'll write till two or three in the morning and then sleep late. So I, I figure it out and it's constantly changing. And that's the thing I think that's also coming with the grace is writing processes change and allow for that change to happen. Um, but it's, it's really important for me to write every day, to write something every day, just so I know I'm doing it. Um, so that, that will be the four hours on the train, the three and a half. Thanks. When you're writing, um, it seems like music is so important mm -hmm. to you and was clearly a part of your work. And you tell the Nikki Giovanni story. So I'm curious, when you're writing, are you playing music mm -hmm. in the background all the time? I have huge headphones that go on my ear. And the minute my headphones go on, the world goes away. So it, it really does create a world. And I have a playlist. I, I'll let y'all have a little laugh because you'll listen. You'll I'm going to tell you some of the songs on my playlist and it changes slightly, but not really. It's called the Jackie writing playlist feels of gold by Eva Cassidy songbird golden thread. And then we get down to like juke jam and all those like it's so, and then there's some Bruce Springsteen. There's some Gustavo, Nina Simone, Indigo girls, Neville brothers, Don McLean, starry, starry night. You got to have Vincent on your playlist. So, I mean, it's Sunday candy, you know, um, J Cole, cause I have kids. So they hit me to people, um, Lil Nas X, um, so it's eclectic <laughs> and it's on, it's on so that I don't even hear it anymore. Um, but it lets me know the world is not there. And then I'm in my right. It's like, almost like putting on a uniform. I have it on, I'm writing. And it all, it also signals to my family not to bother me. Um, and I put them on, like I put them on, on the plane. Sometimes there's no sound cause I don't like talking to people. So the minute my headphones go on, they think I'm plugged in. 
But yeah, the minute I get on Amtrak, they will be on. I was going to ask the same thing about music because your writing is so lyrical mm -hmm. and it has uh, that kind of quality. And in addition to who you listen to, uh, who influenced you in terms of that rhythmical uh, feeling that you get in your writing? Because that's what, when I read you, it's just amazing how the flow of it. Huh. It's it's a lot of rewriting and it is the music. You know, the music, I, I am definitely in my head around the rhythm of the music, but also a lot of poets. You know, I do read a lot of poetry. And as a kid, I was really scared of poetry if it didn't rhyme, but I just did, I thought it was the secret code. Um, and as I've come to understand poetry, um, like um, Long Soldier and Natalie Diaz, and again, Mark Doty and Tim Siebels and Cornelius Eady, they're all these poets that Really, one of my favorite books is a book by Cornelius Eady called You Don't Miss Your Water. And it's a, each poem is um, the title of a song. And it's about him dealing with his dad who he really struggled with and his dad is dying. Um, but there's just such a lyricism to his writing. And, and when I feel like I can't access that lyricism, I will go back and read poetry or I'll just put music on and it brings me back. One. Can we do three? Because I see. Thank you. Um, a question to process. You've written so many books, and I wonder whether you wait until one book is really finished, or at least the editor or the publisher says it's finished, you know, <laughs> before you start with a blank page and even think about the next one. Or do you always have something working away, at least at a thought stage or an outline stage or something? I'm usually working on more than one book at a time, usually two or three. Um, and they have to be very different. Or I'm working on a book in a screenplay uh, or a book in an uh, article or an essay. Um, but yeah, I, I really have to have more more than one project going because if I get bored with one if I get bored and I try to keep writing the writing's going to be boring so then I have to switch gears to the next project which is not boring that's still exciting then I come back to that one but yeah it's usually two or three projects that I'm working on in different genres mm -hmm. could you tell us something about the Baldwin Center for the Arts that you founded yeah so um in um thanks for asking it's um it's located and just outside of new york city in brewster new york i started it in, i in 2018 i got a um a prize from the swedish government from the swedish you know from sweden um where i don't know how many people have been to sweden i've been there a number of times now do you know astrid lindgren who wrote pippi longstocking is actually on their currency like, can you imagine the U.S. having a writer on their money? Um, but I got a call out of the blue at five in the morning. I didn't even know this prize existed. It's called the ALMA, the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award. And it's the hugest cash prize. It's five million. Um, it's in, in U.S. money, it's um, $650,000. And so, and they just give it to a writer who they feel like has done great stuff in the world of um, young people's literature. And, and so since I hadn't expected it, I ended up buying this property and starting the Baldwin, um, um, Baldwin for the Arts, which is a residency for um, writers, composers, visual artists of the global majority. So, um, you know, we pay for everything. We pay for their, uh, we pay for them to get there. We pay for them to write there. Um, we, um, you know, we give them everything they need to create. And to date, we, we, th this is our second season of actually final, of having writers. We had some time off during COVID, but we've housed about 48 artists so far. Um, and we just got, um, we just started construction on new studio. So they get a place to stay. Um, they, we have a chef now who cooks for them. And it's basically just what I had when I was a young artist, a way to like, just take the burden off and be able to write. And then uh, this year, when I got the MacArthur, I, you, the same thing, I, the MacArthur was at a, I didn't expect that prize. And so that became that went to Baldwin. And this is the first year we're starting to fundraise. Um, but it's been nice. Of course, my kids are like, why are you giving away all our money? I'm like, 
it's not your money, right? <laughs> you know, it's mommy's money. But um, but it's been kind of phenomenal. I'm not going to choke up to to see what it can do for young artists. It's it's amazing. So so and and we thank you. I think we have one last one right here. About specificity. But I thought your comments about specificity and general are so interesting. I mean, you're, I mean, if anyone watched Mad Men, it, it's like <laughs> the, the best things are so specific, mm -hmm. but yet they contain universals. I've, mm -hmm. I've read a, a lot of your books, so less than I thought. I didn't know you had read that. So. But anyway, your, your books take place the characters are generally african-american but certainly their themes are universal through mm -hmm. families through generations through different values and so you know one of the sponsors of this is is the diversity committee mm -hmm. and our goal is to diversify who who comes to to our program and i think you know, go back and forth between thinking, well, lifelong learning, the privilege of being able to have time to study mm -hmm. is sort of a, a universal in some ways that people are retired, have time. But of course, that means you're not watching your grandchildren, you're not doing anything else. So I was just wondering if you would make a comment on the tension between the universal but respecting the specificity of people's mm -hmm. experience. Yeah, that's such a great question. I don't know if I, I think it's such a good point in thinking about who has access, right? Um, and what does that access look like? And in terms of making things more accessible for folks, what does that look like? You know, what does it look like if it is the case that people are watching their grandkids and therefore can't take a class to have a daycare center where they can come and drop their kids off so that they can engage, what does it look like to um, have online learning? And uh, I mean, I think it's a, it's a long journey and um, we have to really, in our hearts, want to engage. I always think about when we were trying to find schools for our kids and and people wanted diversity, but not too much, right? And and you knew that, you saw that in the literature, you saw that in who they hired, you saw that um, in in the curriculum. Um, so the the thing about it is knowing, knowing the other and knowing that sometimes the other is you, right? So what does, I don't know, what does it look like? What would the idea, what would this room look like if if everyone who wanted to be here could be here? Because um, I do think it's not, I don't even know how much it costs to take classes here. Um, I don't know how people get here from the Bronx or Harlem. Like there, there are a lot of factors in play. And what, what, how beautiful would that look if um, the retired teachers, right, who can barely pay their rent. The adjunct professors, like there's so many people. We were talking about this yesterday because um, it's a long story, but I was talking to my my beloved who is a physician at Cal and Lord and, and we were talking about the elderly and how for so many of the elderly, you know, el becoming older and poverty correlate, right? Like, why is that, that the older you get, the harder it is to, to support yourself? That's, that's bananas, right? Given, um, and so what does that system of support look like for someone who is, I can't be in class because I have to hit that food kitchen. Um, and so, so what if the food kitchen was right outside of CUNY, right? And they could stop and have a, take a half, sit in on a half hour class and rest and eat a sandwich. I mean, no food's allowed in here, right? But, but like there, I think there, we have to think so deeply outside of the box and outside sometimes of our own comfort level to make, to make inclusion happen. Um, because I think it isn't 
about people not wanting to come here. I mean, y'all seem like a great group of people. I want to take that 1971 class. Like, it's a great room. People are eager to learn. Um, so, so the work is how do we make that happen given the economics and given whatever the constraints are for people. But I don't know. You know, I'm I'm outside of it. I I, I can try to think about it, but but um, y'all know what the work is. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jackie makes it seem like it's a lot of fun to be a writer. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming for our inaugural event at the Graduate Center. So um, we're, we're really lucky to have had you and to be here at the Graduate Center. Um, we're having three more programs this semester. Um, they will all be webinars. So this is our only and first and only in-person presentation. Friday, November 18th, Fridays at 1 is presenting um, Kelly Lytle Hernandez, who has just published a book called Bad Mexicans, Race, Empire, and Revolution in the Borderlands. And it's described by reviewers as a beautifully crafted, impressively inclusive history of the Mexican Revolution. She is a professor at UCLA, and she will be interviewed by Ken Whitty, our fellow LP Square member. So that's November 18th on Friday, December 2nd, also at one o'clock. Uh, Navina Haydor, who's the um, curator in charge of the Department of Islamic Art at the Metropolitan Museum will give a talk on Islamic art at the Metropolitan Museum. And our final series is presented by the Unmasking Bias, Wednesday, December 7th at four o'clock. Paul Butterfield, who um, was a recipient of an LP Square scholarship, will talk about ethics, humor, and bigotry. So I hope you can all come and thank you for joining us. And there will be refreshments in the back.